The oldest literature known to man tells of an all-powerful force underlying everything in nature and occurring throughout the universe. This mysterious force was called prana, and those who learned how to tap it, to channel it through themselves, were said to become like gods. But the world was barbarian then. Plunder and brute power were easier to understand than godliness. Gradually, blood and sand covered the ancient texts. Countless generations would live and die before Western civilization took hold on the shores of the Mediterranean. Less than a hundred years ago, Western scholars began to translate what they took to be ancient Hindu myths. A literature richly imaginative with its talk of cosmic energy and chariots of fire flown by gods from the sky. It remained for the dawning of the space age to prompt us to re-examine our skeptical dismissal of these Indian writings. 20th century science has finally developed instruments sensitive enough to measure what a handful of mystics and psychics down through the ages have claimed to be able to perceive all along. Is the invisible force that Hindus call prana the same as what Soviet scientists referred to as bioenergy in this experiment in psychokinesis, or mind over matter? Could it be the mysterious energy that some psychics claim to see as the body's aura, and which American scientist Valerie Hunt was apparently able to record in a revolutionary experiment at UCLA? Could it be related to the key power which masters in the martial arts claim to focus to perform astonishing feats of strength? Every culture in the history of man has had individuals claiming to possess extraordinary powers. Will we be the first to prove that such powers actually exist? Geniuses, psychics, superstar athletes, masters of the martial arts. What is it that they all have in common? Hey. Uh, not only break uh, board, breaking uh, uh, laws or concrete things. More than his mental power is very important. Yes, sir. Not only will key powers break the board, but key powers to heal, to help men torn muscles and torn ligaments, and to help healing a broken bone. If I've had my ankle broke and my ribs broke, and Grandmaster Lee did key power to these injured areas to help the healing faster. Even when we practice, we can feel key power from Master Lee's body. It flows through their bodies constantly. You can feel when you touch them, when you're near them, when you see them, when you're talking to them. The key power just flows around them.
they can almost have an ESP feeling about it with their own key power. You can sit and think, and they can almost answer your question before you ask it. On the surface, it might seem ridiculous to compare a brilliant pianist with, a, with an unstoppable running back. But they have one significant thing in common. They are extraordinary. Why? Where does their gift come from? Is it possible that they are able to tap some sort of force which is generally unavailable to the average person? The Lee brothers, Ju Bangli and Ju Sang Lee, are masters of the Korean martial art Hwarang Do. Using ki power or internal energy, they are able, they say, to make their bodies lighter, heavier, hard like steel, or capable of blocking out pain. Key power supposedly resides in everyone in an area about three inches below the navel, but only masters have learned to manipulate it like the Lee brothers. They are able to push their bodies seemingly beyond human endurance without injury. <sighs> A steel wedge pressed against the throat, struck by blows hard enough to splinter wood. object to strike hard enough with a razor-sharp sword to slice the zucchini in two without cutting flesh while blindfolded. concentration aspect is the most important. Preparatory exercise beforehand is the one method of building up this power, controlling it for short periods of time. Then when the truck passes over the stomach, as long as the mind does not lose concentration, then there's no problem. If it loses concentration even for one instant, then injury can occur. <laughs> It's impossible to tell whether a phenomenally gifted athlete is simply doing things any good athlete can do, but doing them better, or whether he is also tapping an entirely different level of human capability. In the extraordinary experiment filmed by Soviet scientists, which you are about to see, there is no such confusion. The gifted subject is clearly doing something people are supposedly not able to do. Now, either the film is scientific fraud, or Nina Kolagina is moving objects with willpower alone.
American scientists who have seen this film do not consider it fraudulent. Madame Kulagina has become quite famous for her controversial and still unexplained power. Whatever it is, it reportedly leaves her exhausted after a session like this. Dr. Thelma Moss, a leading American researcher in extrasensory phenomena, was impressed enough by witnesses' reports of Madame Gulagana's feats that she designed some willpower experiments of her own. These were in conjunction with her pioneering work in Kirlian photography, which some researchers believe to reveal some form of energy surrounding the body. There we see one man's finger and another one interacting with him. As we watch, we can observe that while the two fingers are in fairly close position to each other, the person on the left is blank in this interaction. As soon as the other person removes his hand, the emanations come out brilliantly all around. Here we have an interaction between two men who are having an argument. As they continue with their verbal fight with each other, the person on the left gets weaker and weaker. By an act of will, the man on the right is actually erasing that other person, but suddenly he fights back. And here you can watch, slow down that extraordinary interaction between the two men. No camera is used to make a Kirlian photograph. A weak current of electricity passing through the film to an object in direct contact with the film produces the picture. For Kirlian movies, objects in this case, fingertips are placed against a transparent electrode and filmed by an ordinary motion picture camera. All right. You're neither a 10th degree black belt nor a mysterious woman from behind the Iron Curtain. Let's say you're an ordinary person. Suddenly, you're singled out by crisis. A friend is trapped under the wheels of a car. You have to lift the car save his life. Could you do it? Most of us have heard stories of people who did. And of course, they're never able to repeat the action later. Where did that burst of superhuman energy come from? Jack Swartz says there was nothing extraordinary about his powers of concentration until he found himself fighting with the Dutch resistance during World War II. Suddenly, he had to become almost superhuman just to stay alive. Now, he is a favorite subject with several leading researchers in parapsychology. There's alcohol to get rid of any of the oils, and what I'm doing right here. I just blow in there just to evaporate some of the alcohol. And I just rub some electrode paste into the skull. And it'll glob more. And I'll just repeat this once again. Eric, cheat this up. Control frontal area. That goes into uh, number eight. Well, I'm going to uh, push this needle uh, through the left bicep, and I like to state it is an unsterilized needle, and let it totally penetrate. It will go in on this side here on the inside of the arm and come out on the outside. And I'll leave it in for several seconds, and then we'll pull it out again uh, to show that uh, the first place in the recording that's at the moment being done of my brain waves, my heart rate, and my muscle motion, and uh, 
the galvanic skin response to see what kind of changes would occur physiologically. And then when I pull it out, uh, the attempt is going to be made not to make it bleeding and uh, to have the holes closed as fast as possible. Would you like to uh, comment something on this? Uh... Well, I think I'd like to say, Jack, that uh, although under some circumstances this could occur without bleeding, uh, certainly uh, most often with a needle of this size pushing it all the way through the uh, upper arm you would get uh, uh, a reasonable amount of bleeding and particularly if you happen to hit a larger vein. Do you think, uh, Dr. Leslie, uh, that uh, there would be any uh, uh, indication of physiological changes taking place? Right, I think that would be a much better way to evaluate right. it. Uh, you're hooked up to uh, this apparatus, and I think that would give a much better idea of, mm -hmm. of what response is occurring. Okay, I will uh, now start penetrating. There doesn't appear to be any bleeding at this point, and certainly I didn't detect any uh, particular appreciation of pain on Jack's part. Uh, uh, the instrumentation will perhaps show whether there's been a change of any sort or not. Could you give a comment on where it has penetrated? Um, has it gone just through skin or has it gone through tissue? Has it uh, hit some veins? It appears, Jack, as though it's gone through certainly the skin, uh, possibly a small vein in this area, and I think through the biceps muscle as well. I'm now going to uh, pull the needle out, and then you just observe what happens with the arm. Now, Dr. Leslie, would you be so kind to uh, put a kind of a uh, physical tunicate on there to see if we can get any blood out of it? Certainly, uh, there's no evidence of external bleeding and no evidence of any hematoma underneath the skin. No swelling of any kind, really. The Lee brothers, Nina Kolagina, Jack Swartz astonish us. But spectacular though they are, their feats alone can hardly be said to prove the existence of an unknown force. If only we could see it somehow. Perhaps we can. Again, through Thelma Moss's Keelian photography and the mysterious phenomenon of the phantom leaf. Well, this was a very long and frustrating process, the search for the phantom leaf. And it was only after two years that we finally obtained this. Our procedure evolved so that we would cut a leaf directly from the plant. Then, before the leaf was ever placed on film, Part of it was cut. It was then placed in contact with the 4 by 5 piece of film, covered with a piece of glass, and with a piece of copper backing. An electrode was attached to the stem of the leaf. Suddenly, the phantom. Not only do we see the edge where the leaf has been sharply cut, but continuing beyond where we assume the leaf would show had it not been cut away. This particular leaf has been cut in a pie shape. We can see that the phantom gradually emerges. When the emanations do emerge from where the leaf has been cut, it shows the same jet-like emission that the rest of the leaf reveals. Here is a phantom produced not in our laboratory, but by Mr. Robert Wagner at Cal State Long Beach. He chose an ivy leaf for this portrait, and very brilliantly one can see that the tip of the leaf is clearly visible, even though it has been cut away. Is the energy body of the leaf, which we seem to see in the Keelian photograph, related in some way to the invisible energy with which Nina Kolagina manipulates objects. 
or which the Lee brothers are apparently able to focus. In the electromagnetic spectrum, radio and television waves are transmitted and received with the use of antennas. If what we are looking for is a form of energy, would an antenna of some kind help us to find it? Dr. Paris N. Garefus, a Los Angeles dental surgeon, read some amazing accounts of dental implant operations performed beneath pyramid structures. The report stated that pain and swelling were significantly reduced, perhaps due to something called pyramid power. The first operation a year ago uh, was done without the pyramid grips because by that time we did have them in the ceiling of our operatory. Today we will perform this operation under the pyramid grips, which at this point are hanging uh, in the ceiling of our operatory. And we are very uh, curious to find to what extent we will have different type of phenomenon, pain-wise, healing-wise, as well as from the personal point of view of our patient. We have been using now the pyramids uh, installed in uh, one of my operatories for about four months. And uh, my observations were very encouraged to the point that we don't have as much pain. And in such of those uh, heavy uh, operated uh, patients, uh, we didn't have pain at all. Uh, Swelling-wise, which is a procedure that always uh, comes post-operatively, uh, we were doing very, very well, and in several instances, people uh, went right away in their jobs. In any kind of uh, surgical procedure, we incise and we break the tissues. And there is a theory that that way we break that magnetic field. Pyramids as antennas take, concentrate, give back bioplasmic energy to the surrounding field, and we don't have as much breakdown of this magnetic field. Therefore, we have a better kind of healing uh, post-operatively, as well as we have elimination of the pain procedure. There is a definite fact that there is a source of energy activated through the pyramids. Dr. Garefus met with Nick Edwards, the inventor of a lens-shaped pyramid grid structure, and Tom Conley a metallurgist who developed the special metals used in both the dental implant operations and in the pyramid grid system. This is a uh, pyramid system which I designed about three years ago, and it's a very advanced system. We have been able to sleep as little as three hours a night for the last three years with very good dream uh, remembrance and uh, a very good charge of body energy, which will give us energy throughout the rest of the day. I have to get up very early in the morning. And one that likes to sleep, as I do, I have no trouble at all getting up and feel just terrific. The system itself is actually a lens of 25 individual pyramids curved to concentrate or focus the pyramid energy resulting from the shape of the pyramid. Hi, Courtney. Courtney was uh, conceived underneath this grid. Uh, we had tried three years to have a child, and we found as soon as we put up the grid that um, conception occurred within 30 days. And uh, in fact, sex became a lot more pleasurable. And uh, one's sexual awareness or sensitivity to it is increased uh, dramatically, and this is the result of uh, one nice try. <laughs> <laughs> I had a terrific pregnancy the most beautiful pregnancy I've known of, and uh, there was a period of time we took the pyramid down for five days, and that was the first time that I felt like I was pregnant, I was being mm -hmm. bombarded with signs of pregnancy that I had not had before, and when we put the pyramid back up, they went away. Courtney just uh, loves it in here, in fact, she's so spoiled that uh, it's a big fight between the dogs, the cats, and Courtney to uh, have bed space on this bed. And she has her own little pyramid, of course, but uh, she likes the big one. There are two different phases of pyramid power. 
One, in ancient history, when the pyramids were built, and at that time, people apparently knew what the devil pyramid power was all about and how to use it. And the modern history of pyramid power, which begins back in the 30s, when uh, people suddenly discovered that there was such a thing. and television and radar. These are specially designed shapes to pick up energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. The pyramid is apparently a specially designed shape to pick up the energy in one of the other spectrums. The other energy spectrums, which are known to exist in physics, have not been explored because they don't have any meters or means of measuring it or means of generating it. Is it possible that the positive effects supposedly produced by pyramid power are actually psychological in origin? When you can take a dead fish and put it in a pyramid and have it mummify, very few people would agree that you could psych out a dead fish. Therefore, there is something here that is beyond just a psychological effect on a human being. This is a vast dry lake. Once there was water here and life. What secret lies hidden in the strange dance which may change the face of medicine in the 20th century? Emily Conrad, dancer, healer, and shaman, the Indian word for medicine man, believes the secret to healing today lies in our forgotten origins and those parts of ourselves ignored and repressed as man evolved into a thinking being. To Emily Conrad, the unknown force is actually our own life force. We are energy, she says, and we must flow freely to stay healthy and to grow. To achieve this unrestricted flow in those she works with, Emily claims to use an ancient technique called channeling the same as that used by many native healers. She works not with the physical body, she says, but a body of energy surrounding it. The startling thing about her extravagant claims is that for the first time in history, there may now be scientific data to back them up. I guess these uh, very disparate energies came together a couple of years ago when I came to Dr. Hunt's laboratory to demonstrate some movement to her, some movement that I had developed. I had myself an experience. I traveled throughout the world studying primitive dance, but I had never seen uh, any dance that looked like this. to develop a kind of a dance that I'll call channeling that is a healing dance and I wanted to find out from someone who knew nothing about what I was doing what the aura would look like and so I called someone up and I said uh, can you recommend the best aura reader in Los Angeles it was an incredible day for me because at the time I was still working and practicing in my living room and Emily came in and she took out a bell and she began shaking it and then she began howling and it got louder and louder. And I began worrying about the noise. But as this process was going on, the energy got more intense and more intense and it built up and it was this incredible explosion of energy and it changed color frequencies and it went into areas that I knew to mean healing. Well, after Rob gave me her report, I called Dr. Hunt and I told her a little bit about what was going on. She said, I'll clear the deck. Early morning we met and uh, Emily said we were gonna make history today and I was very excited about making history until Susan got out of the car and started to walk. And at one time, back in the 1940s, I was head of a polio clinic, and I thought I knew polio. And this was 21 or 20 years that she had had this condition, and my crest fell. And I said, yes, we made history today. I opened the building for the first time since I had been here. I was positive that absolutely nothing would happen, but with Emily's excitement and with my appreciation for her work, 
I had to record. The three of us went into a conference in the corner. And they told me about things like chakras that I'd never heard of. They told me about auras that I'd never heard of. And finally I said, Robin, would you come over and tell me where I am to put these electrodes? We used the technique called electromyography, or electrical recording of muscles, because it is the most valid measure of what happens when a muscle contracts. In muscle contraction, a minute amount of electrical energy is generated. This can be picked up by these small white sensor discs you see me placing on the surface of the muscle. The small package worn around the waist is a miniature radio transmitter. By plugging the wires from the discs into the transmitter, muscle electrical signals are sent across space like radio signals to the receiving equipment behind the glass compartment. This system is similar to what monitored the astronaut's heart and blood pressure during flight. going from blue to violet and back and forth. We're starting to get a secondary shell of energy about four feet from the body, and it encompasses both the healer and the healing at this point. Emily's pulling a lot of energy up the main central core of her body, and it's coming out her hands and her head, entering Susan's body. There's beginning to be an awful lot of pink in the, the lavender that both of them have around their bodies. And the secondary shell of energy that we established is beginning to go a little pink out here. As they're working, um, we're getting aura up around the top of the head, and it's very white, pluming from the top of the head. The rest of the aura is holding pretty closely at six inches from the body. It comes down the body. Not so much the arms as the main core of the body and the legs. Emily's beginning to be as violent as Susan. So the two of them have kind of established a relationship. I had just been pretty disappointed by doctors and had some a lot of trouble with my surgeries. And I wasn't going to go back to a doctor again. And through a friend of a friend, I heard about Emily, and she said, sure, come on over and, you know, we'll see what we can do. So I went to her studio, and she asked me to lie down on the floor and tied yellow sashes around my knees. <laughs> Again, she, you know, with the bells and everything, and I was a little bit nervous when I started, but as she started making the sounds, you know, I, my eyes were closed, and I wanted to peek, but I didn't. And I thought I'd be scared or something, but I felt really good, and I just felt all this movement in my legs, and they felt like they were perfect. Both of them were equal, and we both knew that something would happen if we worked together. I began to work with Susan on our sessions three or four times a week, and after about three months, the their activity began, and that's when we, be, we decided to work in tandem to do a project with Robin doing the oral reading and Dr. Hunt doing the measuring and Susan doing the regenerating and me doing the uh, whatever it is I do. And there's a real interesting discharge. Oh, there goes another one. Did you catch that, Dr. Hunt? As it goes by? Yes, Robin. We picked it up. That seems to increase the energy faster. Every time you get around a ball and socket joint, the energy goes in so much faster than, than when you're working over the center of the body. Mm -hmm. You said my aura is blue and changes to lavender from blue. What does that mean? Well, the aura itself is very fluid around the body. It exists in a four to five inch area on almost everybody all of the time. Most mechanical equipment has an aura, and the human body has an aura that emanates energy and life force, and it changes its colors according to how you feel that day. 
Now, I think most of us are uh, in growing and being with people. We get used to being with people or not being with people. And we forget that when someone walks up to us that we don't particularly like, it's because they've plunk their energy down next to us and we're interacting in terms of, of physical energy. And that may be disruptive. Now, you're blue almost all the time. That means you're kind of a mellow person, you're kind of calm and mild. And when Emily does healing on you and begins channeling energy into you, it transforms you into a different frequency, into a color that's a healing modality. She goes into violet and white and amber and colors that change your cell structure, your muscle structure, the way you're able to move. You, in effect, ride the energy. That's what does the physical therapy that moves things around. Now, I think that one of the potentials of man is that all men should be able to see auras should be able to see into bodies and through walls. I think that's part of our potential that we've never tapped. And that when we become more aware of living in a world that's really energy, that a lot of our attitudes towards people will change too. Like all investigators exploring uncharted areas, we did not set out to prove anything. Our aim was to study what happened to weak and paralyzed muscles during treatment by an unconventional healer. Electromyographic data of this experiment were digitally converted for statistical comparison. You will see some of the remarkable findings in a few minutes. In the meantime, Emily continued to work with Susan and periodically filmed the healing sessions to reveal any further progress. Throughout these pictures, Susan's muscles move involuntarily as the result of the healing energy. In other words, even if muscles are degenerated to the extent that Susan cannot move them, the healing technique apparently can provide the energy source to create contraction and to start regeneration. In the beginning hip pictures, you will see that the hip is moved by the spinal movement, not by hip muscles. Here the energy moves through the extensive scar tissue caused by the surgery that built up her shallow hip joint making it more stable. In these later hip films, note the dramatic, large, involuntary sequences, rhythmically flowing in great undulating waves, as though the nervous control system is being reprogrammed. At the first healing sessions, there was no contraction of the hip flexors or buttocks muscle. In this beginning knee sequence, notice the energy is flowing downward from the hip activating the knee muscles into subtle, involuntary contraction, like the growth of a tree outward. In these later pictures, see the strong rhythmic action of the muscles above the knee. It is important to remember that at the first healing, these muscles had only a tremor. Observe carefully the flatness of the foot and the stiffness of the arch in this picture. Susan had a triple arthrodesis operation which fused the arch bones, making her foot stable so she could bear weight. It left her foot and ankle so rigid that walking was difficult. The energy field seems to have an intelligence that directs the sequence of change. These pictures of the inside of the foot are very important. Notice the muscles crossing the ankle, moving the foot upward. Before energy healing, Susan had a drop foot. Gravity caused her toes to drag on each step. Now she can flex the foot and clear the ground. Remember the early pictures with the stiff, immobile big toe and the inactive, small ones? How exciting to see the full gripping of the toes, the mounding of the arch, with tremendous movement to the great toe. The healing energy moves through the fused bones, eliminating scar tissue, activating, even regenerating, I believe regrowing destroyed muscle tissue. Now Susan can grip the earth. She can stand surely on it, and she can push off from it to walk. You can feel it. You can feel it everywhere. You can read it every day in the newspapers that our 
species is urging towards something new. And so the soil of the culture will tolerate someone like me. People think that I was uh, trained by some voodoo priest in Haiti with some mysterious charms and sat around swallowing um, rum and doing all these strange things. And it's hard for people to understand that I was actually born this way. We keep looking outside for people to show us, to give us knowledge, to do this and that. We have everything. Emily Conrad trained in classical forms of dance for almost 30 years before founding Continuum. Continuum grew out of her conviction that we have placed enormous limitations on our relationship to the physical universe and particularly what we call the physical body. This is one of the implants that Dr. Garafus uses in his dental surgery. It's an alloy made from surgical vitalium, which at one time, before its refinement into this special metal, was just rock. Now, where would the human race be today if primitive man hadn't perceived that a rock is not just a rock, but one phase of a process, a process that includes metal and the development of increasingly more sophisticated metal alloys which have transformed our way of life. If the energy that is both rock and metal undergoes this much transformation in its physical form, what might we do with our own energy if we were able to see it as more than just our body? here in a very symbolic gesture I'm holding the serpent which is coming from my left side with my right hand in mythology and in all antiquity the serpent was the symbol of primary energy and in our seeding of our world in the Bible the serpent is considered evil is considered Lucifer is a messenger of the devil is considered the lowest most destructive force this has been the seeding of our culture. So we find that our, our understanding of human energy is pretty much that it's evil, that it's destructive, that it's Satan. What might come of allowing ourselves to identify with this primary energy rather than rejecting it by calling it base and evil? I find it so interesting that we accept the human body as it is, without any question, we kind of look at ourselves as if 
This is it. And as far as I'm concerned, it's only the beginning of it. It feels clear to me that we're here to continue the development of it. It's an interesting phenomenon that happens. When you de-densify muscle, this is a muscle in 20th century society, and it functions this way. In continuum, which is the work I teach, the muscle moves this way. Well, this has such profound implications in terms of human functioning on just a simple muscular level, it de-densifies matter. In Western culture, a high kind of articulation in terms of the legs is unheard of. In Susan's film, when you see the healing energy of her legs taking over, you'll never see a Western leg that will move like that. Western legs move in a very rigid way. When the body begins to lose its conditioning or loses its relativity, the free growth, the seeding of the evolutionary aspect immediately takes place. And so we don't have to wait for, for society to evolve for the next millennium. We can actually experience that evolution now. Emily Conrad says we can experience our own evolution right now. Our reader, Rosalind Briere, believes that eventually we will all be able to see the body's alleged energy fields. What is the scientific evidence that auras actually exist? Rosalind described colors of the human aura, the radiating energy surrounding the body. The left side shows the electronic recording of the pattern of minute energy recorded from sensors placed on the lower abdomen or kundalini during the healing. Rosalind described the aura as magenta in color. The right picture shows the energy pattern taken from the center of the forehead or the third eye. Rosalind saw the aura as blue. These slides represent only two of the many dynamic energy pattern changes throughout the sessions, and these did correlate directly with auric changes reported by Rosalind. This is strong evidence that an electromagnetic force, which has been called ki, prana, bioplasmic energy, and life force does exist, and that it can be studied scientifically in our electronic laboratory. You have seen visual evidence of changes in Susan's muscle. But do we have evidence of what took place in the energy field during the healing process? On the left is a Curlean photograph of Emily's fingers before a healing session. The picture on the right of Emily's fingers after the same session displays a major change to a complete full white corona. On the left is a Curlean photograph of Susan's fingers before healing. The right side after healing still shows the white flares, but now expanded and more complete. These two slides indicate that some dynamic action took place, which affected the fields of both participants. To regrow atrophied muscle tissue lost for so many years is so revolutionary as to be medical heresy. We have considered this physiologically impossible with our present knowledge. However, it did happen. Prana, key power, bioenergy, pyramid power, auras, and the phantom leaf. The life force within each of us, which Emily Conrad believes we can tap to experience our own evolution. All of these theoretically and seemingly disparate forces are being evaluated scientifically today. Is it possible that they are all different aspects of something in the universe which we are only now beginning to glimpse? Visionaries say that we are multidimensional beings, but that we identify with only one level, the physical. We think that we are our bodies we consider ourselves individual entities. The development of the individual is a fairly recent occurrence in our evolution. We tend to think of it as the ultimate level, but is this necessarily so? There are those among us who say that this image of ourselves limits our further growth, pointing to the ecological imbalances that have forced themselves upon our awareness they say that the time has come to participate in the forces of nature which we have unsuccessfully tried to master. Perhaps then, 
we will find that our real selves are far greater in scope than we had ever imagined. Perhaps we will discover that we ourselves are the unknown force. If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is just the beginning. And space is the inescapable challenge to all the advanced nations of the Earth. And to establish the United States as the preeminent space-faring nation. First for the coming decade, for the 1990s, space station freedom. And next, for the new century, back to the moon, back to the future, and this time, back to stay and then a journey into tomorrow, a journey to another planet, a manned mission to Mars. Back to the future. These words might have been more than a speechwriter's choice slogan. A space base on Mars, in the future or in the past. There is evidence that a space base existed on the planet Mars in antiquity. And what is even more startling is that it might have been reactivated before our very own eyes. Is it possible then that what our civilization is discovering today about ourselves, our beginning, our planet, our corner of the universe, even the heavens, is a drama that could be called Genesis Revisited? Only a rediscovery of what had been known to our earliest civilizations? The last decades of the 20th century have witnessed an upsurge of human knowledge that boggles the mind. Our advances in every field of science and technology are no longer measured in centuries or decades, but in years, or even months. They seem to surpass in attainment and scope anything that man has achieved in the past. Man came out of the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, reached the Age of Enlightenment, experienced the Industrial Revolution, entered the era of high-tech, the era of genetic engineering, the era of spaceflight. Astronauts who land like eagles 
In antiquity, they were called Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came. The possibility that modern science is catching up with ancient knowledge has brought mankind to the first chilling incident in a war of the worlds. It rekindles a situation that has lain dormant almost 5,500 years. The incident of the Tower of Babel. In the Babylonian version of the biblical story, the people of Babylon were building a tower whose head shall reach the heaven in which a shem, a space rocket, was to be installed under the direction of their supreme god. But the other deities were not amused by this foray of mankind into the space age. Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the humans were building. And he said to unnamed colleagues, this is just the beginning of their undertakings. From now on, Anything that they shall scheme to do shall no longer be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they should not understand each other's speech. Genesis chapter 11. I'm Zechariah Sitchin. I devoted a lifetime to the study of ancient civilizations, ancient languages, their art, their beliefs, and the knowledge that they had and the question is, when you study, when you look at all that, is it myth, is it mythology, or did it really happen? I believe it all really happened. You are invited to join me in a journey, in a journey in a time machine, a magical journey taking us to the past through the work and achievements of archaeology. Ancient knowledge, how much did they really know? How much do we know about them? Thanks to archaeology, we now know that man's first great civilization blossomed out almost 6,000 years ago. Older than the Greeks, Older than the Mayas, older than the Incas, older than the Egyptians. The oldest civilization in our history. The people who bequeathed it to us are called Sumerians, after the name of their land Sumer, in the great plain between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, today's Iraq. The book of Genesis called that land Shinyar. For many years, the references to ancient kingdoms in old scriptures were either ignored or disbelieved, considered simply myth. We now know that they were historical records of real, flourishing, and incredibly advanced cultures. We are now entering a temple that is actually 6,000 years old. It is a temple that existed in a city called Erev, uh, which until about 150 years ago was known only from the Bible, the biblical book of Genesis. And that temple was dedicated to a goddess, to a female called Inanna, known in later times as Ishtar. You can see here her features, a little damaged. Her divinity was marked by the pair of horns that she had. Uh, she held a jar with the water of life, and uh, she was surrounded as a decoration, but perhaps also symbolically, with a symbol that some refer to as entwined snakes, which was the symbol of science in, in those days, 6,000 years ago. Uh, some find in it a precursor of the Egyptian Anch, which was the symbol of life and creation. And it really was a symbol of genetic manipulation of DNA. 
she also engaged in other activities, among them flying in the skies of Earth and also being an astronaut almost 6,000 years ago. In ancient Mesopotamia, the secrets of celestial knowledge of astronomy were guarded, studied, and carefully handed down by astronomer priests. They often kept this special knowledge on cylinder seals like this one. This clay tablet is the print of a seal about 4,500 years old. It depicts the scene of the god Enlil granting to mankind the plough, the beginning of modern agriculture. But very interestingly, we see at the top here, as the background of the cylinder seal, a depiction of the complete solar system, with the sun in the center, and all of the planets we know of in their correct order, with their correct sizes. Plus, one more planet, which is still unknown to modern science, but is being actively searched for, because it does exist as astronomers now concur with ancient knowledge. The heavens bespeak the glory of the Lord, and the vault of heaven reveals his handiwork. In August 1977, the American space probe Voyager 2 left Cape Canaveral on a journey that would eventually take it, several years later, to the vicinity of our solar system's outermost planets. What Voyager discovered once it arrived there fully corroborates ancient knowledge. Oh my God! For the first time, man is actually seeing Uranus. And it is exactly as the Sumerians had described it 6,000 years ago. Yes, no doubt. Though they had no telescopes, the Sumerians did describe Uranus as Marsh Sig, meaning bright greenish. The Sumerians also explained why Uranus is tilted. Uranus took an almighty bang early on. A collision with something the size of Earth, traveling at 40,000 miles per hour, could have done it. What a strange feature. Is it artificial? Was someone there? on distant Miranda in the past. The Sumerians called Uranus planet which is the twin, the twin of Neptune, that is. Were they right? Now we can confirm the Sumerian description of Neptune as a blue-green planet. Obviously, the Sumerians must have known. Is it possible that mankind is only just catching up with ancient knowledge? That the Sumerians were particularly at home with astronomy is evidenced by the fact that they had known, named and listed all of the planets we know today, including those we ourselves rediscovered only in the past couple of centuries. Nudimud, the artful creator, Anu, he of the heavens. Anshar, foremost of the heavens. Kishar, foremost of firm lands. Rakish, the hammered bracelet. Lachmu, their god of war. Ki, the seventh planet. We call it Earth. The seventh planet, the sacred number seven, 
seven days in the week, seven days of Genesis, seven tablets of creation. Sumerian cosmogony answers many puzzles that still baffle modern science. Central to it was the tale of a celestial collision and knowledge of a solar system with 12 members. That ancient knowledge included the planets Uranus and Neptune, supposedly unknown until discovered in 1781 and 1846, and even Pluto, not discovered until 1930. But most surprising was the inclusion of one more large planet as the 12th member of our solar system. The story of this planet, as told by the Sumerians on their seven tablets of creation, begins four billion years ago, when our solar system was much younger and our own planet Earth did not yet exist. Out of deep space, there appeared an intruder called Nibiru. Drawn into the center of our solar system, passing by Neptune and Uranus and Saturn and Jupiter, it faced an olden planet called Tiamat. When Nibiru, traveling clockwise, came close to Tiamat, which was traveling counterclockwise, its satellite struck Tiamat and cracked it. In a series of collisions, one half of Tiamat was smashed completely into bits and pieces. It became the comets and became what the Bible and the Sumerian epic called the firmament, what we call the asteroid belt. The other half, what we now call Earth, was thrust into a new orbital position. It carried along Tiamat's main satellite, which became our moon. Nibiru itself was caught into a permanent clockwise orbit around our sun, returning to our neighborhood once in every 3,600 years and forever becoming the 10th planet of our solar system. This tale of creation echoed through all the ancient cultures, becoming part of the scientific knowledge that we find in the Old Testament in the creation story of Genesis. Modern astronomy and recent discoveries corroborate this millennia-old tale. So, according to ancient knowledge, Earth was not originally a member of the solar system. It was the cleaved-off half of Tiamat, the planet destroyed in the celestial collision. And Elohim said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land Earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. This is what the ancient peoples firmly believed. What does modern science have to say? Missing crust, half of it missing, sunk down and lies some 250 miles below the Earth's surface. The most obvious place for the missing crust, where planet Earth was wounded, is the Pacific Ocean, now seven miles deep. How deep was it 200 million years ago? How large was the wound 500 million years ago? One billion years ago? four billion years ago. What caused the wound? A cataclysm. Seven tablets of creation, seven days of creation. Anunnaki, Elohim, Enuma Elish, Genesis. When in the heights, 
heavens had not been named, and below earth had not been called, naught but primordial Apsu, their begetter, Mamu, and Tiamat, she who bore them all. Their waters were mingled together. No reed had yet been formed. No marshland had appeared. Enuma Elish. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Genesis chapter one. If we apply the knowledge of the Mesopotamian text to the biblical text, the correct reading of the book of Genesis emerges especially with regard to waters. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament, dividing the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. Upper waters, lower waters. What did the Bible mean by that? What has modern science discovered? The Sumerians described Uranus and Neptune as watery planets. In 1979, 1980 and 1981, the Pioneer and Voyager spacecraft visited Jupiter, Saturn and their many moons and found water everywhere as ice on the surface and as water below the surface. There was water on Io, the moon of Jupiter, and on Jupiter's moon Europa, on Saturn's moon Enceladus, and its moon Tethys, and in the magnificent rings of Saturn. Modern science has confirmed the ancient assertion to the full. There indeed have also been waters above the firmament. A most spectacular corroboration of the presence of waters above came with the return of Halley's Comet to our vicinity in 1986. Water loss at 30 tons a second increases enormously. 70 tons a second. Don't worry, it has enough water left to last thousands of more orbits. The core, half the size of Manhattan Island, contains melted ice. Four billion years old, 90 million miles away from the sun. Halley's Comet has been visiting us roughly every 76 years. Was it known even in antiquity? The unusual celestial object reported in Babylonian texts to have been seen in the year 164 BC is believed to have been Halley's Comet. Significantly, it was considered the scepter star of Israel. I see it, though not now. I behold it, though it is not near. A star of Jacob did course. A scepter of Israel did arise. Numbers 24, 17. Halley's Comet and its likes are truly the messengers of Genesis. And what about waters below the firmament? Data obtained by unmanned spacecraft in the 1970s, and again in 1990 and 1991, reveal that Venus may have had seas, lakes, and rivers in the past. Even Mercury, so close to the sun, had an icy past, and still has water ice at its poles. 
When the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli announced last century that he had seen canals on Mars, he was disbelieved. So was the American astronomer Lowell in 1916. But the unmanned spacecraft sent to Mars by NASA found evidence of ample water in that planet's past. We are forced to no other conclusion but that we are seeing the effects of water on Mars. Mars once had enough water to form a layer several meters deep over the whole surface of the planet. So, what had started out as a dry and barren planet has emerged in the past decade as a planet where water was once abundant. Mars has joined Venus and Earth in corroborating the Sumerian concept of water below the firmament. Anunnaki, Elohim, Enuma Elish, Genesis. Of all the mysteries confronting mankind's quest for knowledge, the greatest is the mystery called life. The Sumerians asserted that the seed of life was brought to Earth from space by Dibiru. Were they right? Life on Earth began when stray comets carrying the building blocks of life crashed into the primitive Earth. Scientists find evidence for this in meteors falling to Earth. trying to find out in the meteorites is to see whether there are any of these molecules related to life. There are certain molecules like the amino acids which may be described as the building blocks of life. What does that imply is that all those events that led to life may be common in the universe. Directed panspermia is reviving the notion of seeding the earth with the first organisms or spores from an extraterrestrial source. Not, however, by chance, but as a deliberate activity by an extraterrestrial society. 3.8 billion years ago, a primordial gene might have appeared, whose message was the biblical injunction, go out into the world, be fruitful and multiply. This would be possible only in the case of extraterrestrial origin. Thus did evolution begin. As we read in the Bible, it was only after all the fishes of the sea and all the fowl that fly the skies and all the animals that fill the earth and all the creeping things that crawl upon the earth, it was only then that Elohim created the Adam. We are not the oldest story of evolution, only its last few pages. Let's get back to the Sumerians' oldest writings. We read that their creators were the Anunnaki, the people who had come to Earth from Nibiru. In advance of their landing on Earth 445,000 years ago, they sent their robots to scout the unknown planet. One hundred and fifty thousand years later, the Anunnaki created man. They made us earthlings to mine in Africa the gold they needed to save their home planet's dwindling atmosphere. How was the Adam created? According to the Sumerians, it was by genetic engineering, a fertilization in vitro in glass tubes, as depicted in this rendering on a cylinder seal. Adam was the first test tube baby. Let us make the Adam in our image and likeness. 
Genesis 1.26. They made us in their image. Therefore, they are like us. They have a far developed space technology. Nibiru comes into our vicinity every 3,600 years. And then they revisit us. Every time they give us opportunities for a sudden technological jump, for better medicine, for a greater science, for a better agriculture, as they have already done in our recent and ancient past. According to the Bible, the Babylonians once tried to reach their gods in heaven, the Anunnaki, by building the Tower of Babel. Today, we would call it a launch tower. What was the target of that endeavor? According to Zechariah Sitchin, it was Mars, our neighbor planet. The 12 members of our solar system were identified in Mesopotamia by specific symbols. Some, as for Mars, Earth, and Venus, indicated their position numerically, as on this ancient stellar. We see the sun with its many rays. We see the symbols standing for four of them in the bottom row. We see another four depicted standing on their cult animals, but really it's a symbolism connected with the zodiac. We see the moon and we see the earth symbolized by the seven dots, which indicated the position of the earth from the outer limits of the solar system counting or coming in inwards by somebody flying into from outer space. The seven dots of Earth and its crescent moon and the six-pointed star of Mars are revealing clues in this 4,500-year-old Sumerian depiction. It shows two figures standing on either side of a craft, a spaceman on Earth on the left greeting a spaceman on Mars. Running water must have existed on the red planet in relatively recent times, geologically speaking. Some believe Mars may have been habitable as little as 10,000 years ago. In the 60s and 70s, the United States launched the Mariner and Viking spacecraft to explore Mars. In one area, called Cydonia, among other puzzling features, a stone carving was seen that looked amazingly like a human face. At other sites on Mars, features could be seen which resemble enigmatic structures on Earth. This is a feature on Mars that NASA nicknamed Inca City. Saxahuaman, Peru. Mars. Nazca, Peru, attributed to the gods. I was especially intrigued by independent researchers' suggestions in their reports that the orientation of the face and adjoining pyramid indicated they were built in alignment with sunrise at solstice time on Mars about 450,000 years ago. According to my conclusions, the Anunnaki had first landed on Earth about 450,000 years ago. It was perhaps no coincidence that the two dates coincide. The only plausible theory is that someone, neither from Earth nor Mars, capable of space travel almost half a million years ago, had visited this part of the solar system and had left behind monuments both on Earth and on Mars. The only beings for which evidence has been found are the Anunnaki. The Sumerian tablets refer to the station planet Mars as the traveler's ship. I've taken it to mean that it was at Mars that the Anunnaki from Nibiru transferred to smaller spacecraft to reach Earth orbiting stations. 
not once every 3,600 years, but on a more frequent schedule. The actual landing on and takeoff from Earth were performed by smaller shuttlecraft. From some other species from another planet. Mars, sometime in its past, was the site of a space base. The unexplained, abrupt end of a Soviet space mission in 1989 suggests that the ancient space base has been reactivated. In October 1988, the Soviet Union sent two spacecraft to investigate Mars, named Phobos 1 and 2, after one of Mars' two moonlets. Although launched by the Soviets, the mission actually represented an international effort of an unprecedented scale with more than 13 European countries participating officially and British and American scientists participating personally, though with their government's knowledge and blessings. Phobos-1 was somehow lost on its way in September 1988. But Phobos-2 did make it to Mars and operated perfectly, sending back to Earth images from the surface of Mars. On March 1, 1989, these pictures of a highly strange grid were received. The grid, here in the upper right, was shot both in the optical and in the infrared range. Later, they were merged into this composite. And here is what this amazing grid looks like once the optical image is enlarged. Then, for the next 24 days, no other pictures were released. On March 26, Phobos 2 sent back images, taken just south of the Martian equator, of this uncanny elliptical shape. aligned with this long linear strip, stretching for 300 kilometers. March 27, the Soviets announced sudden problems in keeping radio contacts with Phobos II. March 30, the Soviet evening TV news of Renia. Good evening. Tonight we start out with a scoop a sensational item. News of a report by Western observers that an accident, a catastrophe, has happened to the Soviet space probe Phobos, which is part of an international program in which some 40 countries participate. But now, the facts. This here represents a unique phenomenon. Before now, no one had ever taken such detailed infrared pictures of Mars. What part of the planet? This one here? Approximately, more or less in this area here, marked red. And then there is a very clearly outlined strip starting here and ending here. A strip about 20 to 25 kilometers wide, which is visible in both the optical and infrared range. These are shots taken on one and the same day. This shadow actually appeared all of a sudden. Why am I calling it a shadow? Because you can see things through it. So this is an object not suspended about the surface, but actually located on the surface itself? Yes, of course. This elliptical shadow then, is it in Mars atmosphere or on the planet's surface? Or is it difficult to tell? One thing is for sure, this something is not positioned horizontally. Well, to me it looks like a rocket taking off from the surface of Mars and leaving a trail behind. What do you think about that? Well, if you'd want to fantasize, it could be interpreted that way too. Now we think we ought to look at the real circumstances that have caused that trail, even though they haven't yet been fully clarified. That's more likely to be the shadow of some object, since surface elements can be seen through it. How long will it take to process all of the information to get more or less objective scientific results rather than fantastic ones? Come back in a week. 
but one week later, no details. Three weeks later, at a press conference, a scientist at the Soviet Space Research Institute offers this curious, unsolicited statement. It does take a minimum of precision criteria to obtain on the image these spots, which uh, some would like to call flying saucers, that appeared within the visual field of the infrared range. It must be pointed out that the flying saucer version is not ours. We'd have wanted it to all be that way. Actually, at first we were saying that there was no flying saucer, that surely all that we saw could be explained in understandable, natural and physical terms. Five months later, in September 1989, British Channel 4 runs a new special on the Phobos mission to Mars. Last year, the Soviets launched two spacecraft to the planet, both named after the Martian moon, Phobos. Their mission was to photograph Mars and land probes on its moon. One was accidentally switched off by a mission operator. But the second reached Mars and transmitted pictures that are still puzzling Soviet scientists. As it swung over the equator, it took pictures from a height of 6,000 kilometers. This is an infrared photograph. It shows differences in temperature. The dark patches are colder. This section covers 600 kilometers. It shows objects down to the size of two kilometers. It's the most detailed infrared picture of the planet's surface. We have some very, very thin lines on the surface of Mars in the infrared, which means it's heat. I mean, it's not visible, it's heat. You could see it through clouds if you wanted to. These have a resolution, these have a width, I would guess, of three or four kilometers wide. You know, and that's the question of what it is. I certainly don't know, and the Russians aren't telling us. Scientists are also puzzled by this shadow, pictured on the surface of Mars by both optical and heat-seeking cameras. They're convinced it's a shadow because they can see objects on the surface beneath. But a shadow of what? Finally, there's the mystery of the vanishing spacecraft. The Russians have yet to release the last picture transmitted by Phobos before it lost contact with ground control. But the Russians have said that it shows an object coming towards the spacecraft, an object which, in their words, should not have been there. The spacecraft was circling Mars, coming into the same orbit as the moons of Mars. And the last picture, about they got halfway through it, and they saw something there which shouldn't be there. Professor Kapitza makes a joke that it's Martian people. British scientists will be able to judge for themselves when the Soviets bring their pictures to a conference at Exeter next month. Because, of course, there must be a sensible explanation, mustn't there? But the Russians brought no pictures to Exeter. So, what about the spacecraft's disappearance? One possibility could easily be that a small meteorite, a small bit of rock, was in the same orbit as Phobos and hit it. But in an exclusive interview with us in October 1990 in Moscow, Professor Lev Mukhin of the Soviet Space Research Institute discredited the dust theory. There were attempts to hypothesize that there had been a collision between the space probe, which was then orbiting Mars in alignment with the orbit of Mars moonlet, and strands of dust surrounding the moon Phobos itself. But some fairly accurate computations made by several organizations and by our institute as well have shown that this assumption is totally baseless. If not dust, then what? A long spell of silence followed until, in December 1991, former cosmonaut trainee and retired Soviet Air Force Colonel Marina Popovich held a surprise press conference at the Russian consulate in San Francisco, where she showed off this photograph, reportedly taken by one of the Phobos craft. It shows in the foreground a strange shape, which Marina Popovich called an unidentified flying object what we refer to as a UFO, clearly set off against what appears to be Mars moonlit Phobos in the background. Mm -hmm. 
So, what about the mysterious shadow? Well, the Russians said it turned up all of a sudden that it was something that shouldn't have been there, a shadow of some object above the Martian surface. But that's not all. In April 1992, as we examined these other images, all taken within minutes from each other, we discovered that the shadow had actually been moving. So the mystery remains, what caused the spacecraft to destabilize? Was it a malfunction or was there an outside cause, perhaps an impact? The question that arises is indeed a simple one. Was the spacecraft Phobos 2 hit by something that put it out of commission? The circumstances in which Phobos 2 was lost suggest that someone might be back on Mars, someone ready to knock out what to them is an alien spacecraft. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. If we can go out into space, could someone from space come here? When NASA launched the Pioneer 10 spacecraft in 1972, it attached to it a golden plaque. With this plaque, Pioneer carries a message to extraterrestrials about its home planet. Its symbols show the radio signature of our sun, where our planet is located, and what we looked like. As Pioneer 10 journeys on beyond the outer known planets, the date it is sending back is also being used to seek a possible 10th planet. Indeed, a March 1992 NASA press release stated, Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the Sun. In the past two decades, astronomers have joined the search to look for one more planet in our own solar system. They designate such a planet, Planet X, meaning both unknown and tenth. to tell us in a few minutes the nature of those discoveries. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but, and you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, the date on here I was just noticing is um, 14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system. And this naturally led directly to you and, and your interest in what we're doing. And that's when you, you sent me this book. You have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some, some, some time aeons ago uh, of, of a, a celestial body which you, I think, named in that uh, paper uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or, or, or somehow uh, turned on, on their side both Uranus and Pluto. Uh, it did a lot more than that, as a matter of fact. In that paper, we hypothesized that this intruder passed very close to Neptune, that it dislodged one of what we then think were many satellites of Neptune, and one of them became the planet Pluto. We actually think Pluto was an escaped satellite of Neptune. 
This will also take the orbit of Triton, the big satellite of Neptune, and reverse it. We'll take the orbit of the satellite near Reed and extend it outwards. We can produce all of the observed aspects of the satellite system of Neptune plus Pluto's orbit just with this one single intruding planet. Uh, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, but it's the, the next one, um, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. And, uh, We've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture at least in your own mind of what we are talking about, a big planet, a small planet. Uh. Well, if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600-year orbit, then its, its mass will be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's it's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet, uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto. And this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the tenth planet. And here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. This is your orbit for the planet. Yes. And uh, um, showing that it would come out of Sagittarius in biblical time. And that once you allow for precession, it would be around into Libra by now. And, uh, which is, again, approximately the area that we're looking in. If planet X exists, we are not alone in this solar system. Astronomers are so sure of the 10th planet, they think there is nothing left but to name it. Alone he stretches out the heavens and threads upon the farthest lead. He arrives at the Great Bear, Orion and Sirius, and the constellations of the south. He smiles his face upon Taurus and Aries. From Taurus to Sagittarius he shall go. The books of Job and Amos. Is modern science really catching up with ancient knowledge? Modern science has indeed caught up with ancient knowledge of Nibiru, and the Anunnaki. And man knows, once again, that he is not alone. Ένας από τους ψυχιάτρους ψυχαναλυτές που έχουν μελετήσει με έγκυρο τρόπο τις συμπτώσεις είναι ο Ιωάννης Αυγουστάτατος. Στη ζωή όλων μας υπάρχουν συμπτώσεις που έπαιξαν ένα καθοριστικό ρόλο. Σημαντικά πρόσωπα που γνωρίζουμε 
το από απίθανε συνθήκε, τρένα που χάνουμε την τελευταία στιγμή και αποδεικνύεται σωτήριο, ένα βιβλίο που ανοίγει τυχαία σε κάποια σελίδα και μα δίνει μια απάντηση σε ένα ερώτημα. Όλοι λίγο πολύ μπορούμε να βρούμε τέτοια γεγονότα στη ζωή μα. Οι περισσότεροι τα προσπερνάμε με ένα χαμόγελο ή με μια απορία. Κι όμω υπάρχουν άνθρωποι οι οποίοι μελέτησαν αυτά τα φαινόμενα και βρήκαν ότι τα πράγματα κάτι κρύβουν από πίσω. Ένα από αυτού ήταν και ο αυστριακό βιολόγο Παουλ Κάμερελ, ο οποίο είχε ενδιαφερθεί ιδιαίτερα για τι ασυνήθιστε συμπτώσει. Τι δύο πρώτε δεκαετίε του 20ου αιώνα, ο Κάμερελ συνέλεξε χιλιάδε περιστατικά συμπτώσεων, λιγότερο ή περισσότερο παράξενων. Το 1919 δημοσίευσε το βιβλίο Ο Νό των Σιρών, το οποίο περιέγραφε 100 περιπτώσει συμπτώσεων και διατύπωνε ορισμένε σκέψει. Όρισε μάλιστα και τρεις παράγοντες αξιολόγησης των συμπτώσεων. Την τάξη, τον αριθμό δηλαδή των περιστατικών που συνδυάζονται για να αποτελέσουν τη σύμπτωση, την δύναμη, τον αριθμό ταυτόχρονων γεγονότων και την παράμετρο, την κοινή ποιότητα μεταξύ δύο συμβάντων. Τι σημαίνουν όμως όλα αυτά τα μπερδεμένα? Αποφάσισα να εφαρμόσω την τεχνική του κάμερα. Βρίσκομαι σε ένα κεντρικό σημείο της Αθήνας και θα κάτσω εδώ όλη την ημέρα. Χαρά στο κουράγιο μου. Εάν δω να περνάνε τέσσερις γυναίκες με γένεια, αυτό σημαίνει ότι έχουμε σύμπτωση τέταρτης τάξης. Εάν ο φίλος μου ο Κώστας από Θεσσαλονίκη και ο φίλος μου ο Δημήτρης από την Πάτρα δουν την ίδια μέρα τέσσερις γυναίκες με γένεια, σημαίνει ότι έχουμε μία σύμπτωση τρίτης δύναμης, γιατί η πόλη είναι τρεις. Εάν τώρα ο φίλος μου ο Κώστας από τη Θεσσαλονίκη, ο φίλος μου ο Δημήτρης από την Πάτρα και εγώ την ημέρα της γιορτής μου δούμε τέσσερις γυναίκες με γένεια, σημαίνει ότι έχουμε μία σύμπτωση με δύο παραμέτρους. Μία παράμετρος είναι οι γυναίκες με τα γένεια. Δεύτερη παράμετρος είναι η ημερομηνία, η ημέρα δηλαδή, της γιορτής μου. Για να δούμε τι έγινε. Κώστα, πώς πήγε το πίγραμμα. Εσύ Δημητράκη μου τι λες. Τι έγινε. Βγάλτε τα συμπεράσματά σας. Ο Κάμερερ είχε περάσει πολλές μέρες παρατηρώντας τους διαβάτες και σημειώνοντας τις περίεργες συμπτώσεις. Μάζεψε τόσο πολλά στοιχεία που πρότεινε και μία θεωρία. Είπε δηλαδή ότι εκτός από την αρχή του αίτιου και του αποτελέσματος που ισχύει στο σύμπαν, υπάρχει και μία άλλη αρχή. Εκείνη δηλαδή που συνδέει δύο φαινομενικά άσχετα μεταξύ τους περιστατικά. Στο ίδιο συμπέρασμα όμως, κατέληξε αργότερα και ο μεγάλος ψυχολόγος Κάρλ Ιούγκ, ο οποίος ήταν πεπισμένος ότι στο σύμπαν υπάρχει κάποια συνεκτική διαδικασία, μία συνεργασία ανάμεσα στην ανθρώπινη ψυχή και τον εξωτερικό κόσμο, που υπερβαίνει τους φυσικούς νόμους. Αργότερα, μαζί με τον ομπελίστα φυσικό Βόλφκαν Πάουλη, ονόμασαν αυτή την αρχή συγχρονικότητα. Τι είναι λοιπόν για το Ιούγκ αυτή η περίφημη συγχρονικότητα. Ο ίδιος δίνει τον ακόλουθο ορισμό. Είναι η σύμπτωση, η νοήμων σύμπτωση, μεταξύ ενός εσωτερικού ψυχικού περιεχομένου και μιας εξωτερικής αντικειμενικής κατάστασης τα δύο που δεν συνδέονται από αιτιατή σύνδεση. Θα σας δώσω ένα απλό παράδειγμα για να το καταλάβετε αυτό. Εάν ανοίξω τη βρύση, θα τρέξει νερό. Αυτό είναι μια αιτιατή σύνδεση. Που σημαίνει ότι είναι μια σχέση αιτίου αποτελέσματος. Ανοίγω τη βρύση και τρέχει νερό. Εάν όμως τώρα πω ότι περνάει ένα αεροπλάνο πάνω μου και όντως περάσει ένα αεροπλάνο, αυτό είναι ένα γεγονός που συνήθως το ονομάζουμε σύμπτωση. Ε, τώρα τι να πω. Ο Ιούγκ ήταν συνεργάτης και μαθητής του Σίγμουντ Φρόιτ. Ο Φρόιτ έτρεφε μία σχεδόν παθολογική απέχθεια για οτιδήποτε σχετιζόταν με το παραφυσικό. Άλλωστε ο ίδιος είχε δηλώσει ότι θα πολεμούσε ισόβια τους μαύρους βάλτους του αποκρυφισμού. Αντίθετα ο Ιούγκ ήταν πιο δεκτικός και πίστευε ότι υπάρχει κάτι πιο πέρα. Κάτι για το οποίο χρειαζόμαστε νέα κριτήρια για να αξιολογήσουμε και να ερμηνεύσουμε. Ο Ιούγκ μιλάει για σοφία του ασυνειδήτου. Γιατί όχι μόνο δεν εμπλέκει τον άνθρωπο σε άσχημες περιπέτειες, αλλά τον καθοδηγεί μέσα από τα όνειρα, μέσα από τις διεσθύσεις, μέσα από τις προφορετικές ενοράσεις. Τον βοηθάει στην επίλυση των προβλημάτων του. Ξέρουμε πολλά παραδείγματα επιστημόνων, οι οποίοι βρήκαν τις απαντήσεις στα διλήμματά τους μέσα στον ύπνο. Ξυπνήσαν και έγραψαν τη σωστή πρόταση. 
Carl Jung, as a psychiatrist, used astrology in the study of his clients by making their personal birth chart. Η Susan Butler είναι αστρολογικός σύμβουλος με σπουδές στο Company of Astrologers του Λονδίνου. The astrologers would say that the Earth, the planets, man are all part of one wonderful concept that was designed millions of years ago. And man has always used the heavens as a guide right from the beginning of time. Ο Jung απέδωσε την έμπνευσή του για τη συγχρονικότητα στον Einstein. Αφού όπως υποστηρίζει, κατά τη διάρκεια των φόρων συναντήσεων μαζί του, συνέλαβε την ιδέα μιας πιθανής σχετικότητας τόσο του χώρου όσο και του χρόνου. Μαζί με τον Πάουλη, διατύπωσαν ακόμα την ιδέα ότι οι νόμοι της φυσικής θα έπρεπε να αναδιατυπωθούν με τέτοιο τρόπο που να περιλαμβάνουν και τη συγχρονικότητα. Η θεωρία της σχετικότητας του Άινστάιν, η ειδική αλλά και η γενική, απέδειξε ότι δεν υπάρχει απόλυτος χρόνος και απόλυτος χώρος. Είναι ένα ενιαίο φαινόμενο το οποίο εναλλάσσεται και μεταβάλλεται ανάλογα με τη θέση του παρατηρητή. Τα δύο ατομικά φαινόμενα απέδειξαν ότι η ύλη δεν είναι τόσο συμπαγής και συγκεκριμένη, αλλά και τα ίδια τα σωματίδια συνέχεια παράγονται και δημιουργούνται το ένα με το άλλο. Άρα, το νέο σύμπαν που αναδύεται από αυτή την κοσμογονία δεν είναι πλέον κάτι το μηχανιστικό και το ξεκομμένο, αλλά είναι μια ενιαία δυναμική οντότητα, την οποία κανείς πρέπει να προσεγγίσει με ένα άλλο τρόπο. Αν λοιπόν η αιτιότητα και ο χωροχρόνος είναι σχετική, τότε και όλοι οι φυσικοί νόμοι είναι εξίσου σχετικοί. Δηλαδή, ισχύουν, αλλά ισχύουν μέσα στενό πλαίσιο της καθημερινότητας. Όταν κανείς κατατεβαίνει στο βάθος, στο μικρόκοσμο ή ανεβαίνει στο μακρόκοσμο, τότε πλέον δεν ισχύουν τα ίδια σχήματα. Οι αλλαγές αυτές της αντιλήψεις μας άρχισαν σιγά σιγά από τα τέλη του 19ου αιώνα, όταν μία σειρά από ιδιοφυείς φυσικούς άλλαξε τον ορίζοντα της φυσικής σε τεράστιο βαθμό με τις καινούριε θεωρίες που προτάθηκαν. Μία από τις πιο γνωστές είναι και η θεωρία των Βάντα. Αν θεωρήσουμε την εξέλιξη των ανθρωπίνων γεγονότων σαν ένα κβαντικό πείραμα, τότε πολύ πιθανόν να ισχύει αυτό το οποίο διατύπωσε ο διακεκριμένος φυσικός και αστροφυσικός Τζον Άρτσιμπαλ Χουίλερ. Δηλαδή, ότι στο κβαντικό αυτό πείραμα δεν νοούνται παρατηρητές. Κάτω από αυτή την άποψη, οι οποιοδήποτε άνθρωποι μετέχουν έστω και εν αγνία τους στο πείραμα, δεν είναι αμέτωχοι του πειράματος, αλλά συμμετέχουν στο κβαντικό πείραμα. Θα σας το εξηγήσω αυτό πιο απλά. Εάν το ίδιο πείραμα το κάνουν δύο διαφορετικά άτομα, το πείραμα έχει διαφορετικό αποτέλεσμα. Γιατί ο κάθε παρατηρητή επηρεάζει το πείραμα διαφορετικά. Σκεφτείτε λίγο. Εγώ αυτή τη στιγμή ξεχωρίζω το περιβάλλον γιατί η διακριτική ικανότητα του ματιού μα είναι ατελή. Εάν η διακριτική ικανότητα του ματιού μα ήταν πιο δυνατή, θα βλέπαμε κάπω έτσι. Που σημαίνει ότι το περιβάλλον και εγώ είμαστε από το ίδιο υλικό. Εάν όμω δεν υπήρχε αυτή η απροβλεψιμότητα, αν μου επιτραπεί να πω, η ζωή θα ήταν χωρί ενδιαφέρον. Εάν εγώ ξέρω σε κάθε στιγμή τι θα συμβεί όταν θα φύγω από εδώ και θα πηγαίνω στο σπίτι μου, τι θα φάω, αν θα είναι ωραίο το φαγητό κτλ. Δεν θα υπάρχει ενδιαφέρον. Ο Θεόφιλο Κάκουλο είναι τακτικό καθηγητή στην έδρα του λογισμού των πιθανοτήτων και στατιστική του Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών. Όλα αυτά που ακούσαμε πριν κάτι μου θυμίζουν. Μου θυμίζουν κάτι που είχε γράψει ο Άρθουρ Κέσλερ για τι συμπτώσει. Τώρα βέβαια είναι πάρα πολύ δύσκολο εδώ να βρει τον Κέσλερ. Γιατί γίνεται ένα χαμό από βιβλία. Υπάρχουν τόσα πολλά βιβλία εδώ. <laughs> Όχι μόνο έπεσε το κατάλληλο βιβλίο, αλλά άνοιξε και στη σωστή σελίδα. <laughs> Όπου και να το πει, δεν θα σε πιστέψει κανεί. Τι με νοιάζει όμω εμένα, από τη στιγμή που λειτουργεί η συγχρονικότητα, ποιο νοιάζεται για το πώ και το γιατί. Ο συνείδητη σε κάθε φορά που έπαιρνε τον πιστό του κρατάει μερικά χαρτονομήματα στον δρόμο. Εγώ δεν καταλάβαινα. Όταν το ρωτούσα, μου έλεγε ότι υπάρχει ένα αρχιτέκτονα στο σύμπαν που φροντίζει τα χρήματα να πηγαίνουν στον σωστό προορισμό του. Μετά από λίγο καιρό, συνάντησε ένα παιδάκι που είχε πάρει το πρόοδο του δώρο στα γενέθλιά του με χρήματα που είχε βρει στον δρόμο. Τότε κατάλαβα. Γι' αυτό λοιπόν να μην ανησυχείτε αν χάσετε ποτέ χρήματα. Τίποτα δεν πάει χαμένο. Ο Αμερικανό ψυχίατρο και συγγραφέα τη Σκοτ Πέκ, επιβεβαιώνοντα τη θεωρία του Ιούγκ για τη συγχρονικότητα, την ονόμασε χάρη, δίνοντάς της έτσι μια χρειά, θα λέγαμε, θρησκευτική. 
Είπε λοιπόν ότι αυτή η χάρη, η συγχρονικότητα, δεν είναι τόσο ένα σποραδικό και τυχαίο γεγονό. Αντίθετα, είναι ένα οικουμενικό φαινόμενο το οποίο συνεπάρχει από την αρχή που υπάρχει ο άνθρωπο και η φύση. Τι κάνει λοιπόν αυτή η χάρη, Μα προστατεύει από διάφορα ατυχήματα. Μα βοηθάει να έχουμε καλή ψυχική σωματική υγεία και έχει σαν σκοπό να ανυψώσει το γενικότερο ψυχολογικό και πνευματικό επίπεδο του ανθρώπου. Αν κοιτά μόνο για τον εαυτό σου, θα πω τη λέξη ότι δεν ξέρω κατά πόσο ζητάμε σωστά. Αν είναι κάτι για το σύνολο, το πιστεύω ότι ενεργεί και βοηθάει ο Θεό. Ο Αθανάσιο Χατζή ή ιερομόναχο στη Μονή Δουραχάνη, στα Ιωάννηνα. Με σημαντικό φιλανθρωπικό έργο. Εδώ και κάμποσα χρόνια, αφού πλέον έριξα την ελπίδα στο Θεό, έκλεισα ένα λεωφορείο που είχε βγει με πρασία από το κτέλ. Δεν είχα βεβαίω λεφτά, αλλά το έκλεισα με γραμμάτιο. Και ήρθα τότε εδώ και τα παιδιά βεβαίω διαμαρτυρήθηκαν οι συνεργάτε γιατί έκανα αγορά δίχω να έχουμε. Λεφτά. Την ώρα που είχα μια συζήτηση έντονη, έρχεται μια γυναίκα απ' έξω, χτυπάει την πόρτα, είδε ο πάτερ εδώ, εδώ είμαι. Βγαίνω έξω, μια κοντή γυναίκα ήταν άγωστη για μένα, έχω κάτι οικονομίες μου, μου τις έδωσε και έφυγε. Και να τη δω τώρα ακόμα, δεν θα τη γνωρίσω. Και μου είχε 32 λίρες όσο ακριβώς είχε το λεωφορείο. Αν όλες αυτές οι συμπτώσεις που συμβαίνουν για το καλό μας, Σα θυμίζουν θαύματα, σα λέμε ότι η επιστήμη δεν αρνείται την ύπαρξη των θαυμάτων. Η μαθηματική επιστήμη μα δίνει και έναν ορισμό για τα θαύματα. Μπορεί να μιλήσει κανεί για θαύμα και υπάρχουν πολλά θαύματα με την έννοια ότι αναφέρονται σε ενδεχόμενα, όπω και στη θρησκεία, με πιθανότητα μηδέν που δεν σημαίνει καθόλου ότι δεν πραγματοποιούνται. Απέναντίον σημαίνει ότι είναι σπάνια. Άρα και ξέρει κανεί τι είναι. Πώ αναλύεται, κανεί δεν το ξέρει. Μερικοί τη αποκαλούν μικρά θαύματα τι συμπτώσει. Και μάλλον κάπω έτσι πρέπει να είναι. Οι συμπτώσει έχουν καθορίσει τη ζωή πολλών ανθρώπων. Ο ηθοποιό Πύρο Παπαδόπουλο μα μιλάει για τη δική του σχέση με τι συμπτώσει. Προσωπικά, εμένα με έχουν καθορίσει οι συμπτώσει. Έχουν καθορίσει δηλαδή τη, τη ζωή μου ολόκληρη, σε όλα τα επίπεδα. Εγώ δεν είχα καμία σχέση με το θέατρο. Από ένα το στόπ ξεκινήσαν όλα. Είχα τελειώσει τη σχολή έτσι, για ενημέρωση. Μου έκανα το στόπ μία συμμαθήτριά μου να την πάω σε μία οντισιόν. Την πήγα στην Οντισιόν που έκανε ο Σπύρο Ευαγγελάτο στη μάμα για το αμφιθέατρο. Ε, ήταν και άλλοι συμμαθέ μου εκεί. Έλα και εσύ στην Οντισιόν, έλα και εσύ. Όχι, ρε παιδιά, εγώ δεν, δεν είμαι έτοιμο, δεν θέλω. Μα έλα, 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 μπουρ, 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 μπήκα μέσα. Μου λέει ο Ευαγγελάτο, τι έχει να μα πει, λέω τίποτα απολύτω. Τότε γιατί ήρθε, δεν ξέρω. Καλά, κάναμε σε αυτό το σχεδιασμό. Αποτέλεσμα ήταν μετά από ένα μήνα εκεί που δεν το περίμενα καθόλου. Τύπησε μια μέρα το τηλέφωνο, μου λένε ανήκετε στη δύναμη του αμφιθέατρου. Αντιθέτω, δεν ανήκε ούτε η συμμαθητριά μου που ήταν αφορμή να πάω, ούτε οι άλλοι συμμαθητέ μου που με είχαν καλέσει εκεί. Στη σύμπτωση ουσιαστικά στάθηκε η αφορμή για να είμαι στο θέατρο. Τώρα είναι για καλό για εγώ το θέατρο αυτό το θέατρο. Ναι. Ο κόσμο γύρω μα φαίνεται να είναι οργανωμένο περισσότερο σαν μία προγραμμάτιστη βάση δεδομένων παρά σαν μία καλά αρχιοθετημένη βιβλιοθήκη. Ίντερνετ, ας πούμε. Είναι ένας τεράστιος, χαοτικός και ανεξέλεγκτος κόσμος. Φαινομενικά, μοιάζει με την απόλυτη αναρχία. Όμως με ένα ειδικό πρόγραμμα, μπορώ να κάνω πρόσβαση και να ξετρυπώσω αντιστοιχίες. Αρκεί να διατυπώσω κατάλληλα το αίτημά μου. Μπορεί αντίστοιχα, μέσα στον κόσμο μας, να κάνουμε κάποια στιγμή κάποια πράξη που να λειτουργεί σαν μηχανισμός ανέβρεσης. Έχουμε τότε θέση σε ενέργεια, ένα μηχανισμό δύναμης. Και έτσι έρχεται η καλοτυχία ή η κακοτυχία, ή τέλος πάντων η περίεργη σύμπτωση. Αυτό οδηγεί στο συμπέρασμα ότι υπάρχει κάποιο είδος αμοιβαίας αλληλεπίδρασης ανάμεσα στο νου και στο σύμπαν. Τι συμβαίνει όμως όταν αυτή η χάρη δεν έρχεται, όταν η βοήθεια που ζητάμε δεν εμφανίζεται. Εκεί... Ο Σκοτ Πέκ λέει ότι υπάρχει μια αντίσταση στη χάρη. Δηλαδή υπάρχει αυτή η βοήθεια που έρχεται να συνδράμει τον άνθρωπο, αλλά ο άνθρωπος την αρνείται, έστω ασυνείδητα. Και γιατί γίνεται αυτό. Γίνεται γιατί ο άνθρωπος έχει μια φοβία, έχει μια απόθεση προς την ίδια την ελευθερία, προς την ίδια του την ισορροπία. Και κατά συνέπεια καταφεύγει στο ατύχημα, καταφεύγει στην αρρώστια ή χρησιμοποιεί άλλου τρόπου για να αποφύγει να είναι υπεύθυνο και να ανέβει, να εξελιχθεί. 
ένα μεγάλο μέρο των ψυχιάτρων σήμερα και πάμπολοι συγγραφεί συμφωνούν με την άποψη ότι τραβάμε την τύχη μα ανάλογα με το τι σκέψει κάνουμε. Ο διάσημο συγγραφέα Πάουλου Κουέλιου αυτό το, το είπε διαφατικά. Το σύμπαν συνομωτεί για να μα βοηθήσει όταν προσπαθούμε να ζήσουμε το προσωπικό μα όνειρο. Θέλω να θυμίσω τους στίχους ενός από τους μεγαλύτερους ποιητές του αιώνα μας, του Τόμας Σ. Έλιωτ, ο οποίος γράφει κάπου «Πού είναι η γνώση που μας στερεί η πληροφόρηση», «Πού είναι η σοφία που μας στερεί η γνώση», «Πού είναι η ζωή με κεφαλαίο που χάνουμε ζώντας με μικρό». Ψάχνουμε. Δεν μπορούμε να ελπίζουμε ότι θα προχωρήσουμε σε μια βαθιά κατανόηση του σύμπαντο και του εαυτού μα αν δεν εξετάσουμε σοβαρά το θέμα τη συγχρονικότητα. Μα ανοίγει μια νέα διάσταση. Μα επιστρέφει τη χαμένη οικειότητα με τη φύση. Δεν είμαστε πια τυχαία σπαρμένοι σε αυτόν τον κόσμο. Είμαστε το ίδιο οργανικά όπω ένα δέντρο, όπω μια πέτρα, όπω η θάλασσα. Αυτή η κατανόηση μπορεί να βοηθήσει τον άνθρωπο να έρθει σε μεγαλύτερη οικολογική ισορροπία με τον κόσμο και ίσω να ζήσει ειρηνικά. Γιατί δεν μπορεί το μέρος να ευτυχεί όταν δυστυχεί το όλον. Είμαστε όλοι καταδικασμένοι ή να σωθούμε ή να καταστραφούμε. Τα παράδοξα των συμπτώσεων είναι τόσο δοφιλή, ώστε τελευταία εμφανίστηκαν μερικά εφιολογήματα με φεδρή διάθεση και υπομορφή βιβλίων με γενικό τίτλο «Ο νόμος του Μέρφη». Το νόμο του Μέρφη το ξέρετε? Είναι, θα λέγαμε, το Ευαγγέλιο του Καντέμι. Μικρές ατυχίες που μπορούν να συμβούν σε όλους μας. Ε, το καλό και το κακό έχουν ένα δικό τους δρόμο και αποφασίζουν αυτά πότε θα μας συναντήσουν. Δηλαδή, ε, είναι σχεδόν βέβαιο ότι όταν ύστερα από ένα χρόνο αποφασίζεις να πλύνεις το αυτοκίνητό σου, εκείνη τη μέρα θα βρέξει. Ή όταν περιμένεις κάτι πάρα πολύ, είναι σίγουρο ότι δεν θα συμβεί τουλάχιστον τη στιγμή που το περιμένεις. Οι πιθανότητες να συναντήσεις τη γυναίκα των ονείων σου αυξάνονται γεωμετρικά όταν είσαι ή με τη γυναίκα σου ή με την κοπέλα σου ή μαζί με το φίλο σου ο οποίος είναι πολύ ομορφότερος και πολύ πλουσιότερος όπως εσένα. Οι συμπτώσεις συμβαίνουν πάντα γύρω μας και εμείς τις θεωρούμε απλές συμπτώσεις. Αν ρίξουμε μια ματιά στα κραυγαλαία γεγονότα της ζωής μας θα δούμε ότι είναι σαν να υπάρχει ένας κοσμικός φαρσέρ που κάνει πλάκα. Τύχη, Εάν τώρα από όλα αυτά που είδατε δεν καταλάβατε τίποτα, επαληθεύεται το νόμο του Μέρφη, ο οποίος λέει κάπου ότι όταν εξηγήσει κάτι τόσο καλά ώστε να μην μπορεί να γίνει παρανόηση, θα γίνει. Συμπτώσεις συμβαίνουν πάντα γύρω μας και εμείς τις θεωρούμε απλές συμπτώσεις. Αν ρίξουμε μια ματιά στα κραυγαλαία γεγονότα της ζωής μας θα δούμε ότι είναι σαν να υπάρχει ένας κοσμικός φρασέρ που κάνει πλάκα. Τύχη, σύμπτωση, συνήθεια, θαύμα, πετρωμένο συγχρονικότητα, υπάρχει πάντα ένας συστόμικος φρασέρ. Μην δίνετε σημασία, μια συνήθεια είναι πια. Αποσκελέτωση. Ο μαστό σαν ανδρικό. Η φυλή εφάπτονταν των ουστών. Πέθανε έχοντα τη συνείδηση ότι πεθαίνει, εξηγεί ο γιατρό.
Ανάπνεε ακόμα όταν έδωκε τη δέρα τη, βγάνοντα την από το δάχτυλο στην νοσοκόμα που τη φρόντιζε. Όταν πια χάσαν τα πάντα και τους αφηρέθησαν όλα, μετεφέρθησαν στη βασιλεία των ουρανών δωρεάν, μέσα σε βαγόνια αλόγων, εκατό-εκατό άτομα μαζί. Προηγουμένως οι άντρες, συγκεντρωμένοι για διάφορες αγκαρίες, υποχρεώθησαν να διατρέξουν καθέτος και εγκαρσίως τους δρόμους με κολοτούμπες απάνω στην άσφαλτο σε όλο το μάκρος, εκεί όπου πριν 20 χρόνια περνούσαν τα τραμ. Εδώ περίπου, μπορεί και από την αντίθετη πλευρά, είναι ο τόπος εκτελέσεως 50 Ελλήνων κρατουμένων στο στρατόπεδο Παύλου Μελά, που τους διάλεξαν και τους εξετέλεσαν εις αντίπινε οι Γερμανοί επί κατοχής. Μεταξύ αυτών, ο γνωστός μου ήταν ένας που... στο κουρίο που ξυριζόμουν, ο Κάλφας. Έπειτα ήταν και ένας δημοσιογράφος της Νέας Αληθείας και εκτελέστηκαν. Το γεγονός είναι ότι μια φορά συνοδεύοντας την χείρα του εκτελεσθέντος δημοσιογράφου βρήκαμε, γιατί τα θάβονταν επί πολλής, κουβαλούσε και λουλούδια και με ρώτησε «Πού λες να είναι να τα ρίξω, να συμπέσουν με τον θαμένο σύζυγό μου». Λοιπόν, ε, ήταν όλο ανακατωμένο και απάνω στο έδαφος βρήκε ένα μισό τις δυο φάλαγγες του δίκτου με τον Ιχάκη και αυτό το συντηρούσε σε ενόπνευμα στο σπίτι της Κατόπη. Γιατί της... εδώ η εντύπωση, της δημιουργήθηκε η εντύπωση ότι ήταν το δάχτυλο του εκτελεσθέντος Κώστα. Αυτό αποτέλεσε και θέμα για ένα πείμα μου που λέγεται πάνω στα βάσανα που επιβάλλει ο άνθρωπος τον άνθρωπο. Η σημαντικότερη αλλαγή που έγινε στο ενδιάμεσο ίσως είναι η εκτόπιση ενός είδους φυτικού μετά την έλευση των Γερμανών, μετά την κατοχή τη Γερμανική. Έπαψε να υφίσταται το φυτό που λέγεται Πέγκανουμ Χαρμάλα και γέμιζε όλες τις πλαγιές του Σεϊσού και μέχρι τη διράδα του Καλάβρου, τους λόφους που καταλήγουν στο Μεγάλο Καραμπούρνο και αντικατεστάθηκε με μια αγριοδοματιά χρώματος πονιορτού φύλλα, ένα πέσιο φυτό που ο λαός τον όμως εγερμανούσε. Η ταύτιση των λόγων που άκουγα ως μικρός με την σε μεγάλη ηλικία γνώση, αυτό δημιούργησε το διαφορετικό κλίμα από, την, από το νοσταλγικό που με φέρνει κοντά στο Παπαδιαμάντη, που δεν είναι ηθογράφος, την οι άλλοι είναι συναισθηματικοί αναλογικοί. Σε μένα δεν υπάρχει συνέστημα, έτσι. Υπάρχει εξερεύνηση. Δεν αναλύω και δεν επεκτείνομαι σε καμιά λεπτομέρεια, αλλά στιβάζω πάρα πολλές μαζί. Και αυτό γιατί αγαπώ το συγκεκριμένο και δια του συγκεκριμένου που ερευνώ, Θέλω να δίσω τον εαυτό μου. Έτσι τώρα, τσακίζοντας τη ζωική δυσκαμψία μου με ορισμένες κινήσεις και διευθετώντας το σώμα μου, νιώθω να είμαι όχι απλώς ο χάρτης ή το παραστατικό σχήμα της Θεσσαλονίκης, Παρά αυτή η ταύτη η έκταση που καταλαμβάνει η πόλη πάνω στην επιφάνεια της γης, καμπυλωμένος σαν τόξο γύρω από τη μητρική θάλασσα, περικλείοντας τη μοναδική μου γέννηση, απειρία γεννήσεων και θανάτων. Μουσική 